Hello and welcome back to MRI Physics Explained. It's your one and only Dr. T.E. Mobbing with a D O double M D. Hmm, doesn't sound the same coming from a nerd. Dang, those rappers are cool. I'll let you guys Google that one. So again, welcome back to all of those who've been following along this complex yet beautiful story of MRI physics so far. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome to the channel. If you like these lectures, please subscribe, like, and comment to support what we do here, follow us on social media, or consider donating using the links below. As a quick recap, let's review where we stand so far. In the past few lectures, we worked tirelessly to solve this problem of signal localization, where we found that if we excite a slice of the body with an RF pulse, our receiver coils will record a very complex looking signal coming from the entire slice. But this complex signal really represents the individual T2 decay curves coming from each voxel of the slice, all added together. I'm just showing a few here, but we can choose however big or small these voxels are and how many of them we want for our image. It's really an imaginary boundary we're choosing with which to break this signal into smaller parts to build an image. If none of what I'm saying right now makes sense, click on the link above to review the first lecture. But remember, we can only see this summed complex looking raw signal with our receiver coils. So we then spent an enormous amount of time and effort developing some pretty ingenious ways to break down our complex recorded raw signal and isolate the signal coming from each individual voxel through the use of slice select, frequency encoding, and phase encoding gradients. Links to these lectures are above as well. And now the fun begins. With all this hard work behind us, we can at minimum build a picture. It doesn't necessarily mean that this picture is helpful in any way, but it is a picture. So now let's do a deep dive on image contrast, what it is and how it can help us. And we're going to get a little philosophical here because out of the thousands and even millions of pictures you've seen throughout your life, have you ever really stopped and thought about what your eyes are actually seeing and why it's understandable at all? First, as shown in the previous lectures, contrast in general represents differences in measured or outputted values. The smartphone or computer screen you're looking at right now is likely applying a different voltage or current to each individual pixel on the screen at least 60 times a second in order to create a pattern that we interpret as something meaningful. On a 4K screen, we're talking about performing this process to millions of pixels. It's really mind boggling to think that we can do this at all. And what decides what these values are can either be completely made up, like in this digital wallpaper, or captured from real life with a digital camera, which uses millions of little individual sensors that convert light into electricity that is then stored numerically as ones and zeros. And this set of numbers provides a pattern for which to reconvert that information back into light on your computer screen in an understandable way. So it's easy to see this MRI picture and think purely in terms of color, each voxel representing a different shade of gray. But remember, this is actually just a matrix of measured values we've assigned a color to. Based on the amplitude of each individual T2 decay curve, measured at a specific time point, and correctly arranged spatially. So again, in magnetic resonance imaging, contrast represents differences in our measured values and what produces changes in these values will ultimately determine what kind of a contrasted picture we can build. Point number two, MRI contrast does not reflect reality and interpretation is in the eye of the beholder. So we have a picture of something on the screen in front of us. And let me ask you this, what is it? Now I'm assuming most of you all here would be able to say it's a head and you would be correct. That's also assuming a lot of you are medical workers, likely in radiology, and so you have some baseline recognition of human anatomy. Some of you may even be able to say it's an MR image of the midline brain and face. But what if we showed this picture to people not in the medical field? Would they recognize it? What if we showed it to a child? Yeah, I think even a child would recognize this as a brain, or at the very least a human head. And this is really interesting if you think about it. We're showing an image of a black and white structure, one that most of you all have never actually seen in real life. 
Unless you've taken a gross anatomy class, which is gross, you've hopefully never cut a human head lengthwise, split it open, and looked at the brain this way. And if you did, no judgment, it certainly wouldn't look black, white, and gray, right? It would have some color to it. So given this, how can a child or really anyone possibly know what this is? Well, at minimum, we can all recognize this shape. Every day, all day, for years and years, we walk around, see other humans, and our brains, pun intended, from a very young age have developed a pattern recognition so we can fill in this shape with whatever color we want. Blue. Green. Even pink. Is this pink or salmon? Eh, who cares? Because it doesn't matter what color we put in here. Most people, including children, would still look at this and say it's a head. But what if I show you a picture like this? Not quite so simple now, is it? A child and likely the general public might have a difficult time telling you what this is. An MRI technologist or someone in medicine would probably be able to recognize this as a brain, and a radiologist would say, oh yes, this is an axial T2-weighted sequence, likely a quick brain sequence, and here's the cerebellum, here's the midbrain, here's the temporal lobes, yada yada yada. At least that's what I've been told. So what changed? What changed between this image and this image, one of which is recognizable to children, and the other which is likely only meaningfully recognizable to a select few. We're still showing an image of the brain in a way that we never see in nature. It's still in this black, white, and gray color scheme, which also doesn't reflect reality, but one is instantly recognizable while the other is not. The point we're getting at is that the interpretation and value of a contrasted image is relegated to the individual perceiving it, and not whether the image is accurately reflecting how this object is actually contrasted in the real world. It will mean something totally different to one group of people than it will to another. So that leads us to our third and final point. Is our picture contrasted in a way that will allow us to see something meaningful? We didn't spend billions of dollars in research and charge patients thousands of dollars to undergo this exam unless there is something of value we hope this exam will provide. At least this is how efficient and equitable medical systems work. <clears throat> in the context of medical imaging, the whole reason we are doing this is to identify what's there anatomically or physiologically, and more importantly, what shouldn't be there as our contrast is going to be derived from the physical properties of the substances we are imaging. Just look at these three different pictures of the same region, all exploiting a different physical property to produce a contrasted image. On the far left, we have a CT image, which is obtained using x-rays. The x-rays will be absorbed differently depending on tissue density, and this produces a map of tissue density that we call a CT image. This image will look much different than a nuclear medicine image, which is based off the fact that different tissues will metabolize a radioactive tracer at different rates. So the contrast in this image is a map of cellular metabolism. And both of these will differ from the contrast as is captured in our MRI imaging. All of these generate a contrasted image, but from a completely different physical property, and each comes with its own unique set of advantages and disadvantages. So which one will allow us to see the pathology? Well, that completely depends on what pathology it is you are hoping to see. So let's take a look at this image of the brain, thinking about the importance of what we are seeing. If you ask any radiologist what this is, they'd likely respond that it's a T1-weighted axial slice of the brain. And if you ask them what's wrong with this brain, they'd also probably tell you, I don't know. And that's because the contrast in this picture isn't helpful in this very limited context, which is kind of weird if you think about it. We're showing you the signal from the nuclear magnetic resonance of all water protons making up this structure, but it isn't useful in depicting big differences in contrast between tissues that are diseased and ones that aren't. If this was our only way of contrasting images in MR imaging, it wouldn't be as helpful as it is today. But thankfully, as this lecture is all about, we have more than one source of contrast in MRI. And so let's take a look at the same anatomy except with T2 weighting. A little different now, right? Same anatomy, same physical principle, but with completely different contrast. And now you may be wondering what all these little white areas are here that we didn't see before. 
Why do we see them now? And perhaps more importantly, what do they mean? So the last question we should be asking ourselves is, does our imaging modality provide us with enough contrast to see this pathology? And since we've already shown in magnetic resonance imaging, our contrast is derived from measuring these individual T2 decay curves, anything that contributes to the signal can potentially be used as a source of contrast. So let's start our contrast discussion by focusing on T2 weighting. Because whether you've realized it or not, we've been talking about it the whole lecture series. I mean, how many times did you hear me use the term T2 decay in the past lectures? You could almost play a drinking game with it. As a quick refresher, let's go all the way back to the first lecture and look at this masterful animation we adopted from the PIRL YouTube channel. All credit goes to them. Go check out their channel and support them. Remember that the signal detected by the MRI machine is what we call T2 decay, which represents how our signal decays or decreases as all the protons initially spinning in sync with each other start to slowly speed up or slow down relative to one another after the excitation. And the more out of sync or dephase they become, the more our signal decays and is lost. So let's start by looking at a voxel that contains something with very few water protons, such as bone. After we excite this slice with our RF pulse, this bone voxel will produce a rapidly dephasing T2 decay curve as shown. Now let's plot the signal coming from a voxel containing mostly soft tissue, as shown here. This will produce an intermediately dephasing T2 decay curve, and because this tissue contains more water protons than the bone voxel, we tend to hold onto the signal longer, producing a more slowly decaying signal curve. Finally, let's plot a voxel containing CSF, which is almost pure water. This will produce a very slowly dephasing T2 decay curve, as shown. There's little else to disrupt these water protons, allowing them to spin and spin and sync with each other for a very long time. Now to make things a little less messy visually, let's draw a line contouring each of these T2 decay curves. And we'll hide the curves themselves to clean things up. So as we discussed in detail in the previous lectures, we need to pick a time point at which to compare all of these individual T2 decay curves, calculate their values, and appropriately locate them spatially. We call this time point TE, or time of echo. What a great name, right? Notice where our chosen time of echo is in this example. As you can see, if we measure the current for each curve at this time point, we would get significantly different values between the CSF, soft tissue, and bone voxels, with the CSF voxel being the highest and the bone voxel being the lowest, almost zero. If we were to map a color scheme to these values where the highest numbers are near white and the lowest are black, we would get a picture like the one shown with great contrast between these three tissues. If we choose a TE far to the right, what signal remains? we'll see that the bone voxel has nearly completely decayed, and the soft tissue voxel is greatly decayed, barely above the bone voxel. But the CSF voxel is still going strong due to its very slow decay time, and is significantly higher than all the rest. If we mapped colors to this like we did in the prior example, what would our picture look like now? We'll see a picture where the CSF is bright, much brighter than any other tissue while the soft tissues look almost as dark as bone, with very little contrast between the two, but great contrast comparing those to CSF. Now this one is a little more difficult. What if we choose our TE here, immediately after our initial excitation by the RF pulse? All of these tissues will have a very high signal, giving us a picture that looks like this. You can see in this example, there is very little difference between the CSF and soft tissue values, and therefore both will be very white when our color scheme is applied, with very little contrast between the two. Now the astute viewers of this video may say, what about the bone? It's still black. And this brings about a super important point. In these examples, I'm actually using image processing tricks to minimize or exaggerate contrast. It works well in the previous example, but isn't as accurate here. 
And this points to the fact that the contrast we see from MR imaging comes directly from the nuclear magnetic resonance properties of the tissues in the slice and not from cheap tricks we can play with the contrast after the picture is captured. If we could see everything by simply using different post-processing algorithms, there would be no need for different MRI sequences. We would just use the quickest method to obtain a picture and then manipulate it in whatever way is useful after it was captured. So this picture should actually look like this. All tissues mostly white with very little contrast. And you may ask yourself why we would want a picture that looks like this. Well, we will get to that very shortly. So from these examples, you can see that the time we choose to compare our recorded signal, the time of echo TE, will dictate how heavily T2 weighted our image contrast will be. The longer the TE, the more heavily T2 weighted. So let's play this game in reverse. Where do you think the time of echo, TE, will be for the image shown? A better way to ask this is, what are you seeing in the picture? It looks to me like anything composed of water is extremely bright. The bile within the biliary tree, water within the stomach and bowel. And this stands above almost all other tissues, which are almost imperceptible they're so dark. So this would correspond with a very long TE, where almost all signal has decayed except those voxels which mostly contain water. Do any of you know what type of image this is? Here I'm showing you a picture from an MRCP study, which stands for Magnetic Resonance Cholangiopancreatography, in which we want to visualize fluid within the biliary and pancreatic ducts. As you can see, this will have a very long TE. At our institution, it ranges from 500 to 700 milliseconds. And this correlates with a point at which almost all other signal has decayed except for water. How about this image? Where do you think the TE should be? Now this isn't quite fair, because it requires you to realize that this in fact is not a T2 weighted image, but a T1 weighted image. So the better question here is how do we minimize T2 contrast in this picture? We would want to pick a very short TE so that the T2 effects do not contribute to differences in our measured values. And in fact, a T1 weighted image has a very short TE on the order of 10 milliseconds. So the burning question at this point is what is T1 weighting and how does it play into all of this? And I can't tell you how incredibly difficult it was to find this information. But rest assured, we haven't left out some critical new concept. It really does play into what we've been talking about all along. And the answer is hidden within this figure in front of us. So for now, let's tie up some loose ends with T2 weighting. I want to clarify some confusing terminology you might come across, especially on gotcha exams that claim to be the pathway to success in life. Because T2 decay reflects how spinning protons speed up or slow down relative to surrounding spins on the XY plane, it's sometimes referred to as spin-spin relaxation or transverse relaxation. And speaking of relaxation, you most certainly will be shown this figure at some point. Typically, it's how people start off the discussion on T2 contrast. You're going to be told matter-of-factly that the definition of T2 relaxation is when 37% of the signal remains, or reversely when 63% of it has decayed. And this is horribly misleading and confusing because you naturally start trying to fit this definition into MR imaging. You say, here's our T2-weighted image. It must be captured at a time when 63% of the protons have decayed and stop. Stop, stop. The harder you try to apply this, the more confusing it becomes. And that's because, as shown in all of our lectures up to this point, we're not choosing a time point where every single voxel has decayed to 63% of its initial value. In fact, this is suggesting we would have to find a unique TE for each individual voxel, which is preposterous. The whole point of MR imaging is to compare the signal coming out of each individual voxel at a single time point catching them all at different states of decay, not some magical 37% value. What this curve and definition are illustrating is that yes, if we put a pure substance in the scanner, let's say a bottle of water, and excite it, there is technically some point at which 63% of the signal has decayed. We can record this time for any pure substance. 
But this is a huge distractor when talking about how we build a picture using nuclear magnetic resonance. You want to know what a picture of pure water looks like? Is this what we're trying to visualize or diagnose pathology on? No. Someone out there had to come up with a definition for this property of a pure substance, and it may have value elsewhere, but not for our purposes. So memorize it for exams and then forget about it. And with that, we finally come to the moment you've all been waiting for. We're going to go in deep detail on T1 Contrast and bring this epic basic series of lectures full circle. But I think we've had enough for one day, right? My dog has to take me on a walk anyway. He won't even look me in the eyes anymore. I've spent so much time obsessing over these lectures. So please, if you like these lectures, keep subscribing, liking, and commenting. The support has been overwhelming so far, and I really appreciate it. Here's the sole Creative Commons image we used during this lecture. Our usual disclaimer on the images and animations. And that's all, folks. See you soon for the epic conclusion of MRI Physics Explained. This is Dr. T.E. signing out.